Okay, what rules Solar? Okay, firstly, it's going to be me. Um, I trust that people at least know who we are. Um, you're on the Stratafin webinar, so I trust you know that I'm the CEO of Stratafin. Um, been in the industry my whole life, practiced as a property attorney for over 20 years, and in 2014 started Stratafin with the goal of assisting bodies corporate with their funding without catching them, them in a debt trap. Stratafin strives to be a fair and equitable money provider for the sectional title industry in South Africa. Then we've got the giants of the industry here with us today. We've got Dylan Yershop, um, a legal practitioner of the High Court, specializing in law pertaining to community schemes and the concomitant compliance issues faced by community schemes. He's conducted various seminars for the National Association of Managing Agents on compliance aspects relating to property, the Property Practitioners Act. Dylan has obtained his LLB degree with distinction and thereafter completed his LLM in estate law. Dylan is an associate of DTB attorneys um, and is a community schemes uh, specialist attorney. DTB attorneys is a Stratafin's preferred service provider and panel attorneys. Then we have um, Mr. Hendrik Hoffman, the founding member of Sectional Title Living South Africa, a group that we all partake in and are members of. Um, so Hendrik, upon his completion of his BCom degree in business management at the University of Pretoria, embarked on a career in the sectional title industry. With more than 10 years of experience under his belt, he recognized, recognized a, a pressing need for enhanced transparency, streamlined processes, and superior services through the incorporation of technology. This prompted him to establish Rice Property Solutions in 2018. Hendrik's extensive knowledge and proficiency in sectional title matters have earned him uh, invitations to numerous radio shows where he has served as a valuable guest speaker. He has also established the largest Facebook in South Africa regarding sectional title, further cementing his reputation as a leading management agent in the industry. Please don't read that out fully. Everyone can read. Don't read it out. <laughs> okay. Zerlinda, um, yes, she is. Thanks for being Hi. with us. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, Aubrey. So, just Aubrey the is first paragraph. Just the first paragraph, Aubrey. <laughs> Aubrey is, is a qualified town and regional planner that studied at the University of Pretoria, has spent 10 years gaining experience as a senior town planner of the city. Uh, Council of Pretoria and the Department of Housing. He's, he established multi-prof intelligence in 1998. So there you, you go. That's our esteemed panelists. And what we're going to do is we're going to give over to Dylan to start off with back to basics. Guys, let's keep it as short as possible so that we can have a discussion, the, the debate afterwards, um, so that people can have a look at the different points of view. Thanks, Thank Dylan. you, Billy. Um, I just wanted to start to thank everyone for attending after this lengthy introduction. We've run out of time, so maybe in part two, we'll actually discuss the content. But yeah, um, <laughs> just, just as a point of departure, um, in relation to Back to Basics, everyone will notice that there is a lot of views as to how solar should be done in um, a community scheme context. And one of these views is by the creation of an exclusive use area. So just as a point of departure, when one thinks of an exclusive use area, the roof um, of any structure in a community scheme forms part of the common property. Thus, in order for an individual owner or owners to make use of any part of this roof, an exclusive use area or EUA would have to be created. EUAs are portions of the common property within a sectional title scheme designed for the exclusive use of an owner or groups of owners. So, when one thinks of utilizing the use of solar by way of an exclusive use, we must consider the, the different ways within which an exclusive use can be created. So, it is either 
by the inclusion by way of a rule. So whether that's the conduct or the management rules. And then secondly, the inclusion by way of a notorial deed. And then just as a, as a point of interest, I mean, I think all of us here know all of these requirements, but let's just unpack that so that we understand that if this is the way we want to go, that we understand how we should amend our conduct or management rules. So when one wants to amend a conduct rule, it is in terms of a special resolution, and, and one can find that in section 10 to B of the SDSMA. And then when one looks at a management rule amendment, it is a unanimous resolution, and that is 10 to A of the section of title schemes management. And when I always discuss the aspect of whether one, um, um, how one should go about complying with the requirements for special or unanimous resolution, I always unpack it in threes, which is the notice period, the quorum requirements at the meeting, and then also the voting requirements in order for us to pass this type of resolution. So for a special and a unanimous resolution, one with a 30 days notice of this intended members meeting. Um, from a quorum perspective, for a special resolution, it would be the normal quorum, or one third of the members must be at the meeting, whereas when one deals with a unanimous resolution, 80% of all of the members would have to be present. And then just from a voting perspective, all of these members are now present and they form a quorum. So from a voting perspective, when one wants a special resolution, 75% of the quorum would have to vote in favor, whereas at, at the unanimous resolution, 100% of the members um, forming the quorum would have to vote in favor of this amendment of the rule. And then secondly, when one looks at the registration of a real right, so this would be where we register this real right by way of a notorial deed in the deeds office. Um, we are going to see Aubrey talking a lot about how these drawings would look and how one would um, go about to, to, to design this real right. And then Linda is also going to touch on the aspect of real rights, but that is just simply one would get a notorial deed and that would then entitle you to use that exclusive use area. I think first on the table here, we've got Mr. Hoffman, a very esteemed managing agent, and he would like to also address a few things in relation to solar. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, I've noticed when we went through the introductions, we all need to update our profile pictures. Um, it seems like we're catfishing the people joining the... <laughs> joining the, the the webinar so speak um, for yourself <laughs> so so this morning um what look i'm playing devil's advocate here um to try and and argue that you don't need exclusive use and this morning while i was thinking um about what we're going to discuss today i had an aha moment and i'm not talking the go to the bathroom to brush your teeth look in the mirror and go aha i'm talking to you Aha, but I'll tell you about that at the end. So where I'm coming from is that, that there's so much compliance that one of these days, nobody will want to stand as a trustee anymore. So I'm trying to do it as simple and easy as possible. So um, there's always the question of who should maintain the system. So that's why it's important and where the argument comes in to do it exclusive use. Um, but I can't see why you can't bring it into the conduct rules. Um, there was an article that Prof. Paddock did um, in September 2020, where he used PMR 27 to say that uh, one of the requirements for changing the rules is that whether it's management or conduct rules, uh, you can make rules with regards to additional uh, contributions for maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, um, which made me think about it. And at the end of the day, conduct rules these days don't just deal with conduct matters. The mere fact that you know we do the EUAs in the conduct rules, I think the nature of conduct rules have changed a little bit. My next concern is to create the EUA, and I know Aubrey's going to talk about it later. I'm actually quite excited um, to hear what he's going to say. Is how are you going to do a, a, you know a layout plan on scale? Most sectional title plans don't have the roof area shown on there. So are you going to do building plans? What are you going to do? And then something that I think is a little bit ridiculous, but it did come up uh, when I thought about it is, especially in your older buildings, your sectional title plans have that side view of the building, which shows the roof. I mean, and by definition, a roof is 
is a structure over a unit. It is not a platform for the installation of solar. So maybe it's a change of use that then needs to happen with that. So yeah, um, then the, the I want to go back to the basics. So the installation of solar is a change to common property. I'm not saying improvement and I'll explain why just now for the benefit of a single owner paid by a single owner. So I see it as exactly the same as installing an air conditioner. Um, the, the, the conduct rule 10, the prescribed conduct rule says that you need trustee approval to drive nails or screws into a building. I don't see how solar is any different. It can be removed, it's nails and screws. I understand that there's, it's a lot more work, um, but those are the kind of rules that you bring in with, with your structural engineers signing off, et cetera. Then on the, on, the, on the matter of improvement, because I've heard a lot of people say it's an improvement to common property. The only reference to improvements in the act is in PMR 29. And there's no other definition. And if we read that, it says that, you know, the trustees must inform the owners and where the money is going to come from and what the benefits are. So I read it as the definition in terms of the act of an improvement is something that the body corporate does for the benefit of all the owners which is not the case with individual solar. So that's my argument for it not being an improvement. Okay. And then um, the other thing that I picked up is, is the whole thing about, you know, rules need to be reasonable and equitable to all owners. And, you know, it's the, it's the age old thing of all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And then I found this really nice um, quote by H.L. Mencken to say, quality before the law is probably uh, forever unattainable. It's a noble ideal, but it can never be realized for what men value in this world is not rights, but privileges. So the whole argument with regards to not everybody may have a sufficient roof space or north facing roof space. I'm of the opinion that when you buy a property, you know what you're buying into. I can't buy in the middle row with a small wraparound common property garden and my neighbor in the corner has got a massive garden. I can't then come and claim that I'm not being treated equally. I knew what I bought. I knew I bought a unit with a roof or a north facing roof. I might not have thought about it at the time, but that is what I bought. So that is the whole um, equality thing for me. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna skip the rules to be considered because time is limited. Just my quick aha moment is I was wondering why we are discussing exclusive use areas and rules if we can rent out the roof space. Rent it out, it's cheap, it's easy, it's beneficial for the body corporate, it's much easier to enter into a lease agreement and to, to arrange the maintenance. And like with rental of additional parking in a body corporate, there is never enough for everyone and the same applies to roof. So yeah, that's me, thanks. Thank Thanks you very much. Um, and now we'll hand over to Zerlinda and, and she'll talk about the real rights. <clears throat> Fantastic. I, uh, everybody makes so many jokes, I have to mute myself, otherwise I'll just start laughing. Um, I first want to start off with our introductions. We don't want you to bypass the introductions because we're so full of ourselves. It's just that we've, over the last couple of years, had the fantastic opportunity of really engaging and getting to know each other. So when we do look at these catfish photos and read these very formal professional CVs, mm -hmm. and we think about the conversations that we have amongst each other, we're like, yeah, that's two different people. It's We hope that a lot more of the audience um, are able to get to know us the way that we know each other, you know, where you can literally just pick up the phone, have a debate, have a conversation and agree or disagree and walk away, you know, happy either way. The more people I talk to with this solar panel installation, the more, uh, the more I confuse myself, to be quite honest. And something that we spoke about um, before we came online was that each scheme is unique. Now, I always tell my clients, you're not unique, your problem's not unique, you know, the body corporates, you know, across South Africa have the same issues, trustees owners have the same issues. But when it comes to the layout and the design, the capability, the structural integrity, the availability of area, the requirements of owners, each scheme is very much unique. And some of the things that we consider is who is wanting to do this installation is the first question. Because if it is going to be the body corporate that is going to be embarking on this project, there is a lot of things that we have to take into consideration. Can the body corporates afford it? 
is the body corporates going to raise a special levy for it? Are they going to save up for it? Are they going to enter into an agreement where they own or don't own the equipment? Is it going to serve only the common property? What on the common property is it going to serve? Is it going to serve sections? Um, you know, to what extent are you going to go this route? Is the body corporate going to do something before the owners do something? Because we understand that once you start accepting applications for owners to do this type of work to common property, eventually you're not going to have any common property left. The very first question I got when, um, you know, solar became the, the hot topic was, there's an owner in a high rise building that can afford for their section alone to put up solar panels that will basically take 90 odd percent of the roof. Can the owner go ahead and do it? And, you know, you think to yourself, well, if the owner can afford to do that, that's marvelous. They'll be completely off the grid. But how can it be fair for the body corporate to allow one owner to utilize the entire portion of common property that possibly could be utilized by any other owner? And what we don't very often understand or know when we embark on a project like this is who is going to take this up? Who is going to be interested in this? And it's not something that is often um, the, the, the body corporate that pushes for, because not all the body corporates are cash flush. Not all the body corporates have a lot of common property infrastructure that need this type of additional support. If you have elevators, if you have basement lighting, if you've got legal and occupational health and safety requirements that you have to meet, then of course it's something to look at, but then it comes down to the money. So the biggest question is who's going to do it? What is it going to serve? If it is going to be the body corporates, on the um, on the uh, on the uh, proposal of the trustees, or even on the proposal or the directive of owners or the votes of owners, then unlike Hendrick, I do believe that it is an improvement or an alteration to common property because that prescribed management rule speaks about not only improvements but alterations. Whenever you're going to build upon um, or add to or improve the common property, you know, you're going to install security cameras, you're going to install electric fencing, you are adding on altering, improving the common property. It's not a movable item that you're going to be purchasing. So the question as to whether or not it, it exceeds to that common property is also a legal one that we can debate for quite a while. So I do see it as an improvement. If you are looking at what type of improvements it is, if it's reasonably necessary or not, it depends on each scheme. If you already have enough solar panels to operate your basement lighting and your uh, elevator, then perhaps it's not necessary to go and install more to, um, to do something that is not necessarily essential or non-essential. So then we'd look at it being not reasonably necessary, but it would depend on each scheme. In my body corporates, we have five flights uh, of, of apartments and we've got people that live on the top floor that um, you know are handy capable so now you're going to tell somebody I'm so sorry but during load shedding the elevator is not going to work we haven't made an alternative provision for you so you're stuck in your apartment or you're stuck downstairs I would say that that would be reasonably necessary but again it's can we afford it so the affordability test has to come in as well when you're going to do something like this on behalf of the body corporates you also need to take a very um, hard look. And, and as a trustee, I feel very uncomfortable making this decision. I don't know enough about it, which is why I rely on the experts, is are we going to enter into an agreement with the service provider? Because if we're going to enter into an agreement with a service provider, are we going to allow them to come and use our common property? Because then we have to consider a lease of the common property or servitude. Um, we can't just enter into an agreement like that. If we're going to acquire this, then we're going to be stuck with this. If something's wrong with it, if it needs to be maintained or repaired, that's going to be on us. We have to budget for it. There has to be an appetite for it. So I don't see in my practice as many body corporates going ahead with this type of insulation out of the coffers of the body corporate. It is more from the owners. And this is where the debate starts getting interesting. So if we can pop over to the next slide, when it comes to an owner wanting to install solar, and I'm talking about one owner that wants to install 20 panels or one owner that only wants to install two or whatever it might be, you know, the first question to ask is, is there common property? Are you in a high rise building where the only place is a roof and there's only roof space sufficient for five out of 20 apartments? Or are you in uh, one of these beautiful small Bloemfontein complexes or, um, you know, little freestanding homes in a body corporate that should be a homeowners association where we each have our own roof, own roof, or where we have garages or where we have 
just enough common property space or where we have you know one owner owning multiple sections or whatever it might be it's, it's a little bit easier but if we only have a limited amount of common property we have to be considerate amongst all the owners i've consulted with trustees that have said Ugh, not everybody's going to take this up you know not everybody can afford this you don't know you don't know ownership might change people's situations might change god forbid the entire country goes into a complete blackout we we're going to have to you know, beg and plead and do what we need to do. Um, so you need to think about the use of common property. And in my gut, just having a conduct rule that says, make an application to the trustees and the trustees will consider whether or not we can go with this installation is, 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 is it makes me feel uncomfortable. I believe that the use of the common property has to be formalized. There needs to be an exclusive use area that deals with the maintenance and the responsibility does it exceed to the roof does it still you know can can the person that is moving you know pick it up and take it with them i don't even know if that's physically possible i'd like to hear you know is it going to be a lease agreement and the majority of the instructions that we've been getting by far is the route of going a rule-based exclusive use area so yeah you can see on the slides your options, as Hendrik mentioned, and we're going to talk about more, is conduct rules, management rules, and we'll talk about which one it needs to be in if we go that route. Exclusive use areas, is it going to be registered? We need a unanimous resolution. You need to appoint a land surveyor or an architect. You need to appoint a conveyancer. Is it going to be rule-based, conduct rules or management rules? Conduct rules, as Dylan said, special resolution, simple enough. Management rules, unanimous resolution, the quorum becomes a problem. Lease agreements, who are the parties going to be? Is it going to be the tenant of the unit? How can you make an agreement with a tenant, but the landlord as the member of the body corporate is not even aware of this that is taking place? When the occupier or the owner changes, are they going to take this infrastructure with them? If the common property is damaged, who's going to be responsible for it? Where is it going to be? How is it going to look? You know, these are the types of considerations. That list of conditions every single day just becomes longer and longer and longer. And from our legal perspective, and I'd love my colleagues to, to correct me or to agree with me, is that when you enter into a lease agreement with an owner or an occupier, it is a lease agreement per person, which means you need a special resolution every single time you enter a different lease agreement. So what happens if you know, somebody installs solar panels and then sells their unit six months later? Do we have to go and get a special resolution for a new lease agreement for the person that has bought that unit? Does that solar panel get removed and go with the seller? Does it suddenly, you know, become somebody else's? Does it belong to the common property? And then, of course, when it comes to, and this is something that Billy will touch on, when it comes to an agreement, a contract, when it comes to an exclusive use area layout plan and schedule of allocation, you need to understand where on the common property these exclusive use areas are going to be. And most importantly, who are they going to be allocated to? So we've been consulting with trustees that have said, Right now, we simply want the ability to allow solar panel installations. We don't know who's going to use what portion. We don't know how big the portions are going to be. And we don't know who's going to, to, to get it allocated to them. I believe all of that homework has to take place before you take one of these options. We can pop on to the next one. So some of the, the lesser known ones, I mean, the registered exclusive use areas, nobody has been taking it up as far as I'm aware. Lease agreements have only been dealing with a very few, so it's mostly conduct or exclusive use areas. You could go the route of a servitude, of course, very similar to registered exclusive use rights. You have to have it registered. You have to have a registered uh, servitude agreement. And then, like I said, the conditions are, are, are very, very long, and, they, and the list gets longer and longer. But the biggest ones are maintenance. If it's on common property, is it now the responsibility of the body corporate or is it going to be the responsibility of the person that has installed it? If there is going to be any damage to the common property or damage to another section, who's going to be responsible for that? Uh, if it needs to be removed, if it needs to be replaced, if it needs to be fixed, if it needs to be insured, these are all things to take into consideration other than the certificates and the compliance and all of those fun things, the aesthetics of it, the height of it, um, the the. It, the list goes on and on. And then, of course, very importantly, we mustn't forget that this is still an alteration. So you do still need to go through the process of prior written consent. You have to go through the process of applying properly, letting the, the trustees understand what they are approving if it is not going to the members. And that application comes with 
perhaps a deposit. It comes with a credit, not accreditation, that's a, a, a very naughty word, but um, rather understanding who the installer is going to be, who the contractor is going to be. And we all know the saying, it's easier to ask for, uh, you know, uh, to say I'm sorry afterwards than to get permission before. Um, but something like this, we all have to be very careful about when we enter into it. Um, I can't remember if I've got another slide, we can have a look-see. Oh, that's it for me. Thank you, Zerlinda. Um, as always, I appreciate it that you can just shed some light on this dark topic of solar. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. And then the next speaker is Aubrey Sneiman. Um, as you will notice when he starts speaking, he's already in the roof. So perhaps we will also get a, a practical implementation of how one installs solar on the roof as well. But let's hand over to Aubrey. Aubrey, you are still muted. Sorry, am I unmuted now? You're good to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, I uh, don't want to repeat a lot that have been said because most of it have been said, but uh, on the practical side, I tend to, from the experience that we have with body corporates, tend to think of the bigger picture and the long-term implications of uh, what we propose. Now, uh, as we have uh, discussed already, uh, exclusive use areas can be registered in two different ways. The one is obviously uh, in the rules that we discussed. The other one is uh, when the land surveyor physically come and survey it and put coordinates to it and it get attached, it becomes part of your sectional title plan. Now, that's of course the ideal way to do exclusive use areas, but cost wise, uh, my guess is that you look at about 10 times the cost that you would have in exclusive use areas just registering in the rules. Um, I also feel that uh, registering these for the roofs have the opportunity at the same time to register it for the garden areas, the parking areas, the courtyards, all of those things where we tend to get lots of issues if it is only common property. So there's an extra advantage for me doing the uh, exclusive use area plan. And my, my big picture question is the ability of trustees to really deal with lease agreements separately. Firstly, as Willy said, you need to have a square metrage attached to it. Uh, you can't use the sectional title plan because that uh, is the area of the uh, unit measured on the inside or uh, in the middle of the wall. So you don't have roof overhangs there. And most importantly, you don't include the angle of the roof in the square metrage. So um, what we do when we do exclusive use area plans, and I think uh, perhaps we can move on to the Next slide, there is, is another slide that have a, uh, okay, now that you can also skip, we've dealt with that, the next one have, have the plan on. Okay, so that, that is the typical uh, plan that we would use as an exclusive use area plan. And as you can see, we put the, uh, the square metrage of it in the, uh, in, in the uh, writing part and we, um, put there what it is for, because that's a legal requirement that we need to uh, say what is the allowed use of the exclusive use area. Now, when we do the calculation, we need to take the angle of the roof into consideration. Of course, the, the steeper the angle is, the bigger the difference between the area if you just use the uh, either the building plan or the um, uh, section of title plan. So I, I have concern over the ability of, uh, of trustees to every time do those type of calculations, get the correct 
a square meterage for it and then calculate the correct uh, fee to be paid for it. Um, on the, the other side of it as well is that once you have the exclusive use area plan and it form part of the uh, rules, a new owner knows exactly what he's buying and what the exclusive use area is. Technically, I know it can be changed, but in, in real life, I've never seen that something like that is changed if it's done properly from, from the beginning. So I think it's an opportunity for uh, body corporates to fix a lot of things at the same time, to do it correctly. Uh, the plan must legally be up to scale. So we have square metrics to it. Uh, it's easy to read. We even put, uh, if in some cases, we had a case now where there was already some parking bays was uh, indicated as exclusive use in the, uh, on, on the sectional title plans. So we indicate that in a different color. So you have a, um, one picture to look at and you understand exactly what is happening, who have the use of what. Where if you have separate lease agreements, I think it's going to become very complicated and uh, it's very difficult to manage. Um, uh, the fact that the owner knows what he's buying, I don't agree with. Often there's roofs that is continuous and a buyer or, you know, never really looks at, listen, this is exactly where my roof ends. That's where you start. Um, and I just foresee huge problems. Um, if, if we try to go the other route. If we go the other route, we anyhow need to do a roof plan uh, for allocation of the lease areas to make it fair. Um, I don't agree with the fact that first come, you know, you can take whatever you want and then uh, later on, uh, other people must be happy that nothing is left. I think this is going to become a standard necessity and I think we we should be fair and allow each person per PQ to uh, to get his uh, his fair share of it and uh, so we anyhow a responsible body corporate should anyhow then have a roof plan done to allocate areas either for lease or for the exclusive use areas if you've already done the plan, you've paid for it, um, I think it's, it's just a small step further to allocate it and to put it into the rules, get it approved. And for the next many, many years, you have no questions about that. Uh, on a lease, and uh, perhaps, uh, Linda, you can have a, a, a input on that. What happened if the trustees later on decide um, okay, now there's now new owners that apply. We're going to give it to one of the people that have applied already uh, a year ago. You're a new owner, so we're not going to give you this lease. We're going to give this to your neighbor that uh, was not allocated space before. Um, is that a practical problem that, that can happen? It can most certainly it can most certainly happen, Aubrey. We see it with parking already, where body yeah. corporates go the routes of the of the list of parking bays available first come first serve, and they say, oh, you know, so and so and so was on the list, and uh, you know, now you've got a new tenant or a new owner, they can't get the parking bay. It's it's a very unfair situation. I think you are hundred percent right that we do have to consider it for the future, and perhaps that means that a lease agreement is not the route to go, which brings us back to the rules and exclusive use areas. Yes. So, um, yeah, um, of course, then, as we have discussed, you need to first, uh, in a roof plan or when we allocate it, we need to see which areas are suitable for solar. And then uh, something that very few complexes consider is things like uh, trees. You know, you might have a north-facing uh, uh, roof area, but if in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in the common property or in somebody's exclusive use area, there are trees that makes yours unusable, that should be excluded 
or before the exclusive use areas is registered once you deal with the trees. Um, so yeah, there's lots to consider. I think the uh, not having a proper blueprint of where you're going is very dangerous. And I am concerned that if you go the least uh, leasing areas, uh, it's just going to be done left, right and center without thinking uh, five years or 10 years ahead. And uh, it, it's really not a, a very expensive exercise to do the exclusive use areas, fix the rules. Um, so yeah, I, I would, uh, would go for that option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Um, I think now that all of us know and understand how we are going to get these solar panels on the roof, Billy is going to tell us how are we going to pay for it. Thank you very much. Um, hi, guys. Let me just get myself my camera on here as well. That's it. All right, so funding um, your solar. Um, so firstly, um, as the Linda indicated, one need to determine is the funding going to be required by the individual owners or by the scheme itself. In general, I think the specialized funders in the industry would fund the scheme, but not individual owners. So individual owners would in general go and borrow money on their bonds or pay out of their own pockets, however they been required to make that payment. Um, so I think the specialized people in the industry will make will 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 service the, the schemes in general where you need to pay for electricity for the lifts and all those other things that is required by the common property in general. Um, so I would think that the best, and I'm gonna leave, uh, gonna keep it very short because I want us to have that discussion. Um, so I think the best way to do so is by way of a term loan um, and not a revolving loan. So where you know exactly what you're going to pay, you know the term of the loan, you know the interest rate, and you know when you start and when you finish to pay for the equipment. That would be the most fair way of doing so. And the scheme would know what they're in for and they won't be dragged into a situation where they will pay interest forever in a day um, until such a time as um, something of a nature that we don't know what's going to happen must happen and then it stops payment. So term loan is the best way to do so. Um, uh, we have seen in the industry the upcoming of the so-called power purchase agreement. I just want to touch on a couple of things in respect of power purchase agreement. Firstly, in, in terms of the power purchase agreements that are out there, they do not have storage capacity in general. So it's only solar during the day. So it does not stop the problem of load shedding at night. So that is a problem. Trustees must look at that and make sure that they're not solving a problem that they shouldn't solve because uh, we we are now just supplying electricity um, and we're not solving load shedding. If load shedding is the problem, sort load shedding out and not electricity in a general way. Have a look at the terms of that agreement. Um, how does the owner of that equipment, which is the person that's going to give you the power purchase agreement, um, how do they um, have ownership or do they have control over the roofs of the scheme? Are they renting that from the scheme? Um, what are they paying to the scheme in that respect? How long is that lease agreement? Um, the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act have requirements in that regard. Um, to the extent, I think the reserve lenders must be longer than 10 years, if I remember correctly. So you're going to be stuck into this agreement for at least 10 years. Um, so make sure that you understand that. Um, who's the owner, where is ownership of, of this equipment? Will this equipment ever be paid off or is it just a perpetual lease um, that somebody else is making uh, money for selling electricity to the scheme out of the roof of the scheme? Um, and then we have seen a huge problem with uh, metering of the consumption where schemes have gone the power purchase agreement route where there's no um, split between what is used by ESCOM and what is used from the so-called power purchase agreement. And we have seen that schemes are paying 
sometimes in, in excess of 30% more for their electricity. So make sure that you enter into an agreement, that you understand the terms of that agreement and that you actually are solving the problems that you need to solve. Um, banks in general would not lend money to schemes uh, because there's competing interest. They've got their bonds over the property and then they need to also sue a body corporate if they don't make payment and then which stands first, the bond or the, the second agreement of loan. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's the most, that I think that's in general, I mean, the rest will be in the slide, so people can quickly go through that if they want to, how to make the loan and so forth, what resolutions is required, so that is in there, but let's have a chat about um, what we're here to talk about, um, and um, let's start off with Zerlinda regarding what do you think, um, now that you've heard Hendrik's argument, you've said what you want to say, uh, can you can you give us your insights? So I'm going to talk as a trustee, both in my personal capacity and professional capacity. I do not feel comfortable making a decision as to an owner's application for the installation of solar. I believe that it should be a body corporate decision. And I think Aubrey touched on a lot of those points about availability and, of, and about um, who is going to, be, to benefit and, you know, the first come first serve and all those fun arguments. I struggle to distinguish between a solar panel installation versus a DSTV dish and a air conditioning unit, which we which we put into our conduct rules. We put in our conduct rules that you must make a prior written application for trustees for an air conditioning unit and you must maintain it and repair it and all that fun stuff. So what is the difference? Um, I do think that the minor versus major work comes into play, but you know, arguments can be made for or against it. So I do think it's still very new and I don't think that there's going to be a hard and fast rule. And I believe that it, if you consider everything that you need to consider holistically, and if you table it with the members, you are going to be acting in good faith and there isn't going to be a wrong way to do it. You can't take the shortcut route though. I do agree with Hendrik in a practical or simple route, but you still need to be lawful. So I'm not saying that the conduct rules or the management rules route is wrong. I'm just saying that I think it is dangerous. I would feel more comfortable putting it in the management rules because then you can delegate the function of the body corporate of maintenance of the body corporates of the common property to the owner that is installing it. And you can deal with the common law issue um, and one of my master's colleagues actually messaged me while we were online to say that he's busy writing an article on whether or not this type of insulation exceeds the land, which I think is going to be vital for, for argument as well. You need to be able to deal with that in the management rules. I don't believe that's a conduct issue. And what the CSOS is going to accept is also something to take into consideration. The conditions attached to it is going to be the most important thing. And those conditions are in a conduct rule, a management rule, a lease agreement, or um, a servitude or whichever route you go. And I think that's what we need to focus on is the conditions. Um, so I, I don't think that I have a hundred percent answer on this, but I don't think any of us are wrong. I think we have to look at it uniquely and to shut up after this, quite a few people have asked, is there a template? Is there a template? When somebody asks me for a template, I feel like my skin is going to burn off. There is no such thing as a template. And we have to be unique about this. Um, and you can have certain conditions that are going to apply everywhere, but most often we have to consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that this is bigger than the trustees. If there are trustees that feel more confident than I do, good job to them. But I don't feel confident about making the decision. I, I just want to say, I mean, we've had this discussion before we started um, where Hendrik made the argument regarding improvement. And I said to him, but we must also consider the common law. And that's exactly what you said, the common law in respect of improvement, improvement and does that now form part of the common property? Um, so the, once you have installed it with the intent to leave it there permanently, and that surely is the intent of owners to install that, to leave it there, to serve their property, then at that moment that becomes a part of the common property because it is permanently affixed. Um, and, and then it becomes the, the, the property of the, of the body corporate and no longer the property of the owner as well. 
so I I have difficulty also in in just doing it in a rule um, because I think that there's a problem. I also think it's it's better to go the um, management rule um, route as well because it also makes it more difficult to amend that because you still then have to have a unanimous resolution to change that so people then know what their rights are so they know that. They can do A, B, C, and D, and it's not going to be changed uh, willy-nilly by a next board of trustees calling owners and convincing them to change. It's going to be a difficult uh, task to do so. Um, also, uh, an argument that Hendrik said is that people know what they're buying into. People did not know what, what was going to be the end of the ESCOM game. So we can't say because you bought the downstairs unit and didn't buy the upstairs unit, you you would have known, you should have known that ESCOM is not going to produce electricity. So that's tacky for you. You're not going to have electricity, you're not going to have a roof. So I don't think that there is an argument that one can follow. Um, and I agree with you, you would require to go into a lease agreement for every specific lease agreement, you would require to have a special resolution. So every time that the ownership or the, the person changes, there will have to be a new agreement with that person and you will have to get that special resolution. Um, just my five cents worth. Dylan? Thank you, Billy. Um, ultimately, to me, as I said, there's there's no right or wrong answer. I think that's something that all of us know. Yeah, and, and the ultimate yardstick for me would be that whatever the decision is made by the body corporate, that it is applied fairly to all of the members. Um, this is this might be a controversial view, but I take the view that when one has a look at your roof space and especially the, the roof space that is capable of solar installation, I would say that depending on the contribution that one has towards the body corporate or your PQ, as we all have come to know it, that is the amount of space that you would then be entitled to. Again, it's it's definitely up for debate, but then it just eliminates the, the, the aspect of that different members are treated differently. And I mean, we all know how CSOS loves to latch onto anything that is unfair or discriminatory, and this might just be the case. So that's 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 my 10 cents on it. Let's keep it fair. Let's give everyone the opportunity to install solar and, and that everyone then gets this relief that they might want. Uh, whether or not they make that determination, it's their own prerogative, but they should still have that entitlement to do whenever they make the decision to do so. Fali, you're muted. So I think I'll, I'll take it off. I think all of our colleagues. I have just given wanted to say Hendrik. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to give Hendrik an opportunity to jump Thanks. in here. So, so, so I think the thing is, like, like we've said a couple of times now, there's no black and white answer on this. And and I know I'm one of those people where if I attend a webinar, I want a black and white answer. So, so I'm going to try and give one. And I think it is that each body corporate will need to follow the route they think is going to work for them. And once we have more definite answers, if you, for example, decide you're going to do it in the conduct rules and we see, no, it has to be EUA, no problem, then fix it. Um, because I think trying to get to a definite answer is going to be difficult and it's going to take time. And we don't really have time with ESCOM. So that's my opinion on the matter. Well, I can I can just say, I mean, Hendrik, I've also said that to you before we started. Um, and Zerlinda also mentioned that, I mean, one will have to look at the specific scheme. Zerlinda is currently busy with uh, rules of a scheme that is administered by confiance, where those units are individually situated on their own little stand, one would think if that was, it's almost like a little homeowners association, but it is a sectional title scheme. So in that scheme, I would have no problem to just go rules because um, everybody's got their own roof. They, they all have no facing roof and they, they get what they, what they paid for. And if one is slightly larger, then so be it. So in that instance, I wouldn't even go EUA area. But then across from the offices of Stratofin is a large complex with double story units and the bottom stories don't have roof space. And one will have to do that in a way where everybody is accommodated. Everybody gets their fair share of the roof. Um, so there, one would rather go a EUA and register the EUA and make sure that you've got everything set in stone and um, as difficult to change as possible so that people know what their rights are. 
So definitely every scheme will be different, but I think one must take all the stuff that we are saying into consideration when you make that decision. You must not just jump into it and, and go and say, all right, just go and install, do whatever you want. Because at the end of the day, I posted a, a picture the other day in sectional title living South Africa of a scheme where the roof collapsed um and um, we don't want that we don't want to see that because then we'll have to get mike addison here to sort out all the insurance problems for all these schemes um so so yes but we don't know if they will then be insured that's the other the other problem that we haven't even touched on we, yeah we haven't spoken about the whole structural integrity somebody posted on on the q a you know we need to find out if that and you mentioned your picture that the body corporate can actually withstand something like this what is necessary, what is not. Yes, we would all love to go and install 12 or however many panels, but you know, maybe we don't need it. Maybe we all need to agree to share. And to ask people that live in sectional title to be reasonable is like asking you to take a cold shower in the middle of winter. You know, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult. I 100% agree that the most black and white answer that we can give to satisfy people like Hendrik, because uh, I do understand it's important. If you're going to invest an hour or two of your time listening to people talk, you want to get some outcome out of it, is treat your scheme uniquely and look at what is going to be best and if you feel even a twinge of discomfort as a trustee, take it to your members. There's nothing wrong with going to your members. And you don't even need to go to them formally. You could do like a monkey survey or whatever the heck it's called, you know, like a WhatsApp group, like who's keen, who's not. And look at the, the justifications and the reasons for it. And, um, you know, I don't want anybody to take offense against the template option. And there was a great idea about putting together like a, a chart. Uh, and I can imagine this like, spider organogram thing where it's like if you're going to go this route then don't forget this if you're going to go this route then don't forget that and and i'm sure that all of us are would be more than happy to work together on something like that but make it make it work for your scheme don't try to retrofit something that is not going to fit um make it make it suitable make it work um but there, there is a way around it and we'll, we will all of us online are all like-minded we will make it as practical and simple but still lawful for you and I think that's what the important thing is all about we don't want to end up with that caved in house eh, really that's quite hectic um, I see Paul Davies makes an argument that he says that the lease agreement goes with the property um, so I don't think that that is correct in law I mean there's a lessor and a lessee so once you connect it to the property I mean uh, Latin Dylan you love to say that always um, it's in rem or in persona um, so if it's in, in, in rem then we are not dealing with a lease agreement but we're dealing with a property right and therefore it is a servitude um, one would think or some or other limited real right um, so it's not correct what Paul is saying. Um, you can't do it. Then you have to register a real right in the deeds office. So, Hendrik, yeah. So, 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 I hear what Paul is saying. Don't you, don't you think that if you write it in the right way, it would be a case of hier gaat voor koop? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Let me think about that a bit. Eh? I actually, I'm glad that you mentioned it. I did do that for a managing agent client of ours. It might be online. Um, I said to him, my advice is that you need a special resolution and it follows the person because it's a personal right. It's not a registered uh, lease agreement and it's not a servitude. And we worded it in such a way that it is, like Paul says, linked to the section, but represented by the person successively as there is a change of occupational ownership and we spoke more about the transferability of it and looking at the lease period but again you are taking a higher option of formalization than simply saying let's just go and install it and deal with the problems afterwards we're doing our best we are acting reasonably to formalize it and i think that's what the important step is but your problem is now going to a situation where it's form over substance so you're creating something in a way, but the substance is something different. Um, so now we're opening another can of worms. So all the rabbit holes that we're opening the, from a legal point of view, there's, there's so many fights to be fought about these things. I would rather make sure that I know what I'm doing, 
If you have your EUAs, make sure that you register them, make sure that you do things correctly, put them in your prescribed management rules, make it as difficult as possible to change, because at the end of the day, then you've got legal certainty. There's no way that somebody can attack that, because it was done in the correct way, you've got the right resolutions, it's all sorted. So there's something that I'm just thinking of now, and, and I know, we, I think there's another, it was you and I that had the conversation about exclusive use areas, and... <clears throat> The exclusive use area is, is basically the floor area. You can't have an exclusive use garden and say, okay, well, the wall side of your unit inside the exclusive use is now your responsibility to maintain. So now we register exclusive use in 20 units on 20 units. Um, the exclusive use is technically the area of the roof and we make our maintenance rules, et cetera. So are you now gonna have 20 owners having to maintain their own little portion of the roof, or how would you do that? That, that is an option, um, yes. or you can, it is possible, and, and, and Prof Paddock taught me this back in the day, to have an exclusive use area created over the entire space with multiple holders. So when maintenance work is required, you simply recover it from them as a contribution. But then the argument is going to be, is every single one of those owners only going to use five square meters? Are they only going to install five panels? Are they only going to be from this manufacturer? Because I'm not going to want to contribute towards maintenance if my solar panels weren't the one that pierced the waterproofing, if that's the right terminology. Um, uh, Philip from Narva just taught us this uh, last week or the week before. So there, there's going to be a problem with every option. It's just how to troubleshoot those issues. I 100% agree with Freddie. Really rather be conservative, rather be safe than sorry. And you know what, if somebody's going to complain and they don't have solar, then invite them in for a nice cup of hot coffee or cook their dinner for them or do their laundry or something like that. That should help. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. guys. We've run out of time. Dylan, you want to say something just before we go? Um, yeah, yeah. I just, just want to think... say regarding the questions, we will answer all the questions and send them out um, on email as well. Yeah, so I think I want to close with two things. Firstly, what we've learned now is the chairperson is not entitled to the biggest piece of roof. So please just remember that. And yeah, secondly, I think we should just pull back and enjoy load shedding. I think there's too many issues. So let's just all enjoy load shedding, learn from Frankfurt in the free state and just enjoy our load shedding as and when necessary and just leave all of this. But yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.